This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with David Ingono from the social media page Under Value. He discusses his work into finding hidden gems within the soccer world, the identification process for when trying to replace specific players and their role within a team, as well as his work on social media, where he investigates players and recruitment staff from around the globe. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Good. So, David, really appreciate you jumping on. Um, uh, how are things? All good? All good. All, all good, considering the craziness going on in the world. Uh, it's a little early here in the East Coast of the United States, but yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, all good, thank you. All good. And listen, yeah, I appreciate you jumping on really early um, on, on your side. So, appreciate you getting up nice and, nice and early to do this. I think f- from my perspective, I'm, I'm quite excited to see uh, this conversation or hear this conversation. Obviously, came across you uh, online with your um, Twitter page, particularly, which is uh, at Undervalue. Um, and I think the majority of your work is kind of around recruitment and right fits for young up and coming uh, football or soccer players. For people that maybe don't know you, don't know your background, you just want to give us kind of a, a brief summary of what you've done previously and then what's got you to this point to doing this type of work. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the the the, the Twitter version, the Twitter thread, <laughs> my uh, my background is that uh, I, United States. I grew up playing American football, being just obsessed. I remember being 12, 13 years old, um, having good grades, having honestly very, very good grades, um, and just wanting to play professional American football. Um, I did get the opportunity to do that. Um, and ironically enough, I didn't really find uh, football, world football, or as we call it here in the States, soccer, until the 2010 uh, World Cup in South Africa, in Johannesburg, in South Africa. And I was sharing this with somebody, uh, I think earlier, or about a week ago, uh, Fabio Qualiarella with the Italian national team. I believe they were playing Slovakia. And he hit this, uh, this, it wasn't a screamer, I forget what you call it, but it, it's just one of those, yeah, it was a floater. Hit this floater from outside the box. Uh, the goalie, Jan Muka, reached out his hand, and the ball is literally right here. And the ball is here, and the goalie's hand is here. And the ball went in. And the Italian, I mean, Italy underachieved uh, for obvious, well, for many reasons, that World Cup. But I just remember getting, I still got goosebumps now because I was like, what in the world was that? Because he wasn't one of the players. Uh, that was highly touted going into the uh, tournament. Um, I didn't really know anything about. Um, I didn't really know anything about sourcing talent and ability. I know that if you were good, you're on your national team. I guess you know, um, but I didn't know. It just started started this snowball of curiosity for me. So um, I did start. I mean, I did start off really intrigued with the Italian, you know, Serie A. Uh, but at the same time, since I was a kid, um, so NFL draft. Um, it used to be a weekend long event. And for those of uh, your, your listeners or your subscribers that are not aware, NFL drafts American football, um, they have seven rounds, um, seven rounds. Each team has at least 32 picks, I believe, uh, depending on trades and what have you. So as a kid, as a nine or 10 year old, I mean, I would watch it the whole weekend, but then I would also wait for the paper, the, the newspaper to come out the next day. And I would know each and every school, every position. It's just how I've been wired. So with the advent of, inter, uh, of the internet and email, I always find myself um, trying to find out how those who scout, those general managers or sporting directors, who, how they scout for players, what they look for in players, how they, how they decide if you know, a player can be great uh, or at least serviceable. So I have over 20 years of, of articles and resources that I've emailed myself, um, even well before Twitter was a thing. And I, I just, it's always intrigued me. So that's the, that's the short Twitter thread story. 
Okay, and then where has that led you now then? Obviously, you mentioned kind of with soccer, and as I said, I came across your Twitter threads through some of the work that you've done looking at kind of Danish teams or a little bit of Dutch teams as well. So how has that led into the work that you're currently doing? Yeah, good question. So um, I, I believe I, I have a, uh, dare I say, a, a conqueror's mindset. I, I think as a former professional athlete, one of the things that you you learn pretty quickly is that the odds are never in your favor. <laughs> you know, they're never in your favor. You think they might be, or you can will them in a certain way, but you always have to be resourceful and adapt adaptive. Uh, COVID was huge for me, just as far as um, things slowing down, um, but then also just realizing to myself, man, like, what do you want to do? Um, I've been successful uh, in the business world, if you will, um, run run my own company, have have employees, this, that, and the other. Uh, but at the same time, that that's a uh, job, uh, you know, that's a way to provide for my family. Uh, but I wanted to get back. I've always wanted to. I've, so I, well, I used to always tell myself, not knowing the gravity of it, but I used to always tell myself as a kid, if I can get played, or sorry, if I can get paid, compensated to to make decisions, make better decisions in sports, I. I can't really turn that down. I will always be something that I will um, be like a moth to a flame on. So with COVID and the lockdown, it allowed me to um, honestly on, on Twitter, ask questions uh, to people, uh, figures in the game, uh, especially on the data side. Uh, so we can get more into, into it uh, over the, the course of the conversation, but I just found myself, um, I would read these articles, and again, there's a there's a uh, experiential gap in the states to Europe, um, just as far as um, uh, depth of knowledge. I mean, I can only, only read so many articles, right, and understand how Manchester City uh, gets players or Brentford or whatever, right? But after reading it for two, you know, reading such articles for three or four years, I'm like, you know. Is it really that? It can't be that easy. It, it can't be that easy. And I say easy, relatively speaking, you know, um, as I say on Twitter, you know, uh, is it is it really just about fit and alignment? You know, you don't need <laughs> you don't need no disrespect to, to uh, Liverpool or the other uh, mall, mall, mega clubs out there. But you don't need like astrophysicist and you know, all these guys on, on, on staff. And what I quickly found is that talking to people in clubs. That's great if you have access to it, but really, what is your philosophy? Like, what are you trying to do with these, especially these younger players, these young men who, honestly, they're just trying to get on, trying to play ball, uh, you know, play ball and make the most out of it. How can you do more for them? And that's when I was drawn more to um, whether it's the Red Bull model with Ralph Ragnick, um, 20, what, 2011, 2012, or Brentford. Or even what Ajax does, you know, I, I mean, there's clubs that there's a handful of clubs that do the same things year in, year out. And it seems like, um, you know, only a groundbreaking article or a, a wonderkin comes out and we realize like, oh, there's there's another way to do this instead of just writing a check, you know, for um, a, neck, a potential Ballon d'Or winner. I think Ajax is a really probably well-known and good example to use. You look at the turnover of players for them consistently, but they always seem to find players that maybe others don't want or that are undervalued and do well. Dujan Tadic, for example, obviously left Southampton and then has gone and done really well over there. I think we've got Sebastian Haller at the moment who's doing particularly well mm -hmm. after leaving West Ham. And then you look at, you know, the other way where they've had De Jong, Ziyech, all those type of players that leave and and um, go on and do do bigger, better things at other clubs and on the European stage, which is really interesting. I think for, from my perspective, um, it, what would be really interesting for you to discuss is kind of the process for you. So if you're looking at a particular replacement, so let's say, for example, it was when um, Frankie de Jong then went to Barcelona and they're looking for a replacement. One, uh, quite a few of the articles I read for you is kind of who may be suitable, who may be a up and coming player that could fill that void or potentially fill that void. So, what does your process around that actually look like in terms of 
identifying players? Um, does that come from a statistical basis or does that come from uh, knowledge base? What does that actually look like to begin with? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because it really, it really comes, I'm sorry, it's really context driven. Uh, and what I've learned uh, the hard way is that there's so much I don't know. I mean, I may, I might post, I may say, hey, here are three players to replace uh, a player or to deputize for our current star player or, or um, veteran. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if, if that player um, is going to, you know, resign for four more seasons, you know, with that club. I, I don't, I don't know a lot um, other than um, as to, to begin to answer your question, where to start. I always start with data. Now, um, it's not to say data is better than video or whatever, but I found a way, a work, uh, work through workflow process for me where I start with data. So if I want to, and I forget, because I've, I've been focusing more on the smaller clubs, but I believe Barcelona's midfield at the time when they got Frankie de Jong was uh, Busquets, um, Yikes! I, I kind of forget after that, but he was kind of seen as a, a as a bridge for Busquets. Is that fair to say, roughly? Yeah, I think so. I think they had Bus probably Busquets, Vidal, and maybe Iniesta was coming to the uh, end. It was right around there, it. something like that. Yeah, that was that was the other one, uh, Arturo uh, Vidal. So what I always try to factor into my um, analysis is that. Even if you're at the, the top of the food chain uh, financially and, and, you know, sportingly, when you're trying to replace a player, and this is what I've learned, um, you know, in American football, when you're trying to replace a player, you're, you're going to have models that tell you, uh, you're going to have, the data is going to point you in one direction, but you need to know what your um, baseline is going into it. So um, if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm Barcelona, however many, three, four seasons ago, and Frankie de Jong is obviously, you know, the top of our list, uh, the data is going to say what it's going to say. And for the sake of not, <laughs> not, not being boring about it, that is pretty obvious. Whether you have a bespoke system or you compile um, numbers and stats and you rank them, you know, somewhat by hand uh, or, or through Excel, or Excel spreadsheet, the data is always going to spit out to you what is put into it in a more um, cohesive way. But what I've found to be the uh, separator as far as, um, you know, making good uh, recommendations is either video or, or live scouting, um, because that's where, you know, I, I don't know how you do one without the other. I mean, I know that that sounds like a cliche statement, but I, I mean, it, it would be easy to tell um, given subscription system of data, uh, and I won't name names uh, of, of the companies out there, it'd be, it'd be easy to say, hey, you know, the, on, to post on Twitter, hey, like, you know, Frankie de Jong, um, making up a name, who, uh, you're asking me to go back three or four years, so I don't remember who was the other midfield uh, dynamos at the time. But if Frankie de Jong is at the top of our list, if you haven't seen him play and you just, you know, in my opinion, lazily say that he's played for Ajax, um, and he, he, you know, knows where go to position and he can fit in, you know, Barcelona, Ajax are kind of sister clubs or however they say it, you know, you could get away with it to a certain degree. Um, but where I think that, um, and whether it's a language barrier or, you know, I don't know if we're, we were recording when you started talking about it, when you as a club or you as a recruitment department don't, you don't have to give away your whole entire plan of how you recruit players. But when you don't make it clear that X player is coming in to fill in X roles over time, you don't manage expectations. That's when you you get a, a groundswell if the player doesn't jump off immediately and, and get running. I mean, you look at Jaden Sancho in um, uh, Manchester United. Again, I'll be honest. I don't follow. I don't follow Manchester United news as much as some other people do. Um, what were, what, were, what, were his, what were his legitimate, realistic expectations, you know, other than to come in and do what he did at Dortmund, right? You know, so when I'm looking for a player, I'm looking for his, his next step. Yes, I have an idea of how good he can be if we polish off certain um, 
uh, abilities and, and certain uh, uh, traits. But what is his direct next step? How can he get a thousand minutes in a role in a position that is not a you not you know outlandish for him <clears throat> to be effective? Excuse me, to be effective in. You know, <clears throat> that's the hard part. That really is the hard part. And it takes watching multiple leagues. It takes um, being able to project uh, physical ability as well. Um, that's where being around sports uh, at a high level helps. Um, and I hope I'm answering your question because it's kind of a multi, multi-layered multi deal. Um, but I start with data and then there's there's literally uh, probably eight or nine check checklist points that I make sure like, you know, I mean, can I say, can I legitimately say if somebody, if the sporting director of a club uh, DMs me and says, hey, how do you know about X player? Why, why would you think he would be a good fit for us? Can I legitimately say to him with confidence? Yeah, X player can do Y, Z, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D. Can I say that with confidence? Because if I can't say it, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, my my quote unquote job isn't on the line, but I don't want to just, you know, put forth players simply because they have good data. I mean, that's boring and it's not, it doesn't really help in the real world. So that's, th- does that help a little bit? Yeah, no, it does. I guess one of the questions leads on to is, are there any baseline data points that um, either show high potential or show high performance? So to go off on your more, more recent phrase, as you mentioned that Mario Goethe, for example, of uh, Borussia Dortmund, and you mentioned the I think four players around there, a variety of leagues and stuff that might be able to come in and fill a similar role. So looking at someone like like him, is there any particular data points which you go, right, this is what I need to start off with an outlay point. This is what he inputs or outlays on a game-to-game basis. Um, And so this is what I need to search for when I'm going through, through the data initially. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and it's, it's the uh, it's not the shortcut question. It's the uh, hey, give me the uh, give me the tools of the trade, uh, the, the tips question. And ironically, the number one thing I look at, um, the number one thing I look at, regardless of age, is how many minutes did you play. Um, you know, if I could, if I could give you a list of the players who have similar data to Mario Goza at uh, PSV who don't even have 500 minutes played this season or in the last two seasons. <laughs> I mean, it's almost to the point where, you know, it becomes a fantasy, right? Because I don't care how good you are. If you don't have your boots on, on the pitch, you can't do what the data says that you can do when you're on the pitch. Right. So for me, one of the most, um, it's number one. I don't know if it's one or one A. Uh, honestly, I don't know if it's first or second, but can you stay on the pitch? And ironically, that's that was uh, Mario Götze's issue, right? For five or six seasons. And obviously, it's not that, you know, he was injury prone or what have you. He had some um, health and medical issues that were not necessarily um, fitness related. So my number one thing that I look at is is minutes. And then uh, now, Gotze plays kind of a, um, he's not a, he's more of a connective player. So he has to have a, a more well-rounded game than, say, a striker or a winger, if that makes sense. So what I then begin to look at, before I even look at video, is, okay, is he, and I'll, I say this a lot in my process, is he competent? I'm not looking, uh, I'm not going to find Messi or Frank Lampard, you know, in the second division in France, usually. I'm not. <laughs> I wish that I could, because it makes a couple people a, a lot of money. I'm not going to find Messi. I'm not going to find, um, you know, Bernardo Silva. I'm not going to, those guys have already been found. And trust me, they're, they're, they're highly compensated and, and well taken care of at their big clubs. Uh, and they're under, you know, under 23 setups. Those, you're not going to find those players, generally speaking, uh, through data. Um, that are of, that are viable. So after I've, I've checked the um, their availability, how many minutes they played, I start to look at things such as progressive passes. Um, I, I start to look at uh, honestly, you know, not every team presses, but it, I, I think we're in a generation of of world football where you can't just sit on the you know on the center backs 
uh, shoulder just waiting for the ball. Like you, you have to be somewhat more of a team uh, dynamic as far as uh, connectivity on defense. So I, I just look at the, I look at the whole athlete. And um, when you look at Mario Gotze, he's he's a competent midfielder, but he also adds assists and goals. So then when you start to look at assists and goals, you start to look at obviously passes, but then you look at um, you look at shots, you look at one B one B versus sorry, one B versus one dribbling one on one. Sorry, I'm it's a little early here. I'm getting warmed up, but you start. You start to break down, like, okay, what facets of his game is he exceptional at? And that word is a is sort of a trap door because um, what I've learned uh, over time, over twenty years, twenty five years of just understanding, um, you know, talent is that being exceptional is is kind of common, counterintuitively, but the hard part is finding out, okay, how uh, you know, like I said before, how can he, how can this player get on the field and do a job for us? You know, um, you don't need a left back to score 10 goals for you. But you need to make sure that he he can press and he can intercept the balls and he doesn't let guys in behind him. Right. You know, if he's only playing, you know, three, four hundred minutes, um, you know, you don't really have a, a, a deep enough understanding of his complete complete skill set. So. Um, whether it's uh, progressive passes or interceptions. Yeah, I mean, there, there's ways to find out pretty quickly, especially if you narrow it down to like a league. There's, you can see pretty quickly, okay, he is an aberration on defense. Like there's <laughs> – he needs to go to a, a, a team or a club that plays a certain way or else. Or the data will show you right off the bat, okay, uh, he is – he's maxed out in this league. Like there's, he's, he's really, really good in this league. So if we project him to a bigger league, um, say if we're projecting uh, France league two, uh, second division to uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Eredivisie, can he physically cope? And does he have the, um, the body frame? That's why video and live scouting is very important. I mean, you know, does he have the physical attributes to be, to stick? And it's it's ironic because the, the data will tell you really quickly if a player has a physical capacity to do things. But then at the same time, you can't you can't neglect watching the video because you'll see the size differential between players. You'll see, OK, well, this player is very slight, you know, slight in nature. But how does he keep how is he leading the lead in interceptions? You know, and you'll see it right away and you'll be able to say, oh, no, nope, he there's no way that he could play at, say, um, uh, a Manchester City or Barcelona type. Well, it's not that he can play in that that uh, setup, but that wouldn't be best for him. He needs to play in red in a Red Bull setup. He needs to play in Germany where he can press and not worry as much about, um, let's just say hands in the glove and all that, you know, those uh, tactical terms uh, as far as interchange in, interchanging uh, roles or positions as much on a pitch. That's fine. I think it brings us really nicely to the next question, which is how do you project across leagues? So you may have an individual who's playing in, you know, the Swiss league, for example, and his stats in that kind of a through the roof and they're really, really good. How do you project when he's then going to what is deemed as a more challenging league? Because obviously that you, you'd imagine if you've gone from playing um, in the Swiss league and you're playing uh, one of the top teams, for example, if you then go and play for Real Sociedad and you're playing against Atleticos, um, you know, Bilbao, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, your team might seem less of the ball. They might, you know, struggle, struggle slightly, which then might be challenging for you. So how do you project what someone's going to be able to do from maybe a, a smaller team when they then, then progress? Mo Salah is a really good example of that from FC Basel and then he obviously went to Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it's a great question. It's a question that's always evolving. Um, but ironically, the starting point is the same. You look at availability and you look at durability. So if I'm looking at to use the Swiss League as a as an example, if I'm looking at a player 
who has, let's just make up a number, 2,500 minutes, and he's playing for FC Thun or FC Sion in, in Switzerland. Hey, that's great. He has great numbers, but what is who who has he played against, you know, specifically? So you look at the top of that league, you look at uh, young boys, and you look at FC Basel, and I guess to a certain degree you look at, uh, I believe, um, I was getting Grasshopper and Zurich mixed up. Um, but you look at those top three teams, and you say, okay, how did he com- how did he compete against those teams? But then also um, a silver bullet or a, a giveaway usually for uh, profiles from a smaller club. If they qualify for Europe and they have, I'm going to be very honest, decent, decent numbers in Europe, European qualifying or sorry, Europa League qualifying or Champions League qualifying, you know, you know that that player is, is competent. You know, uh, again, that, that's a word that I use a lot. Because the, the number one variable for players' success uh, when they, whenever they transfer anywhere is the manager. Um, I mean, I haven't talked about it yet, but a good manager can get a good player to do great things. And to ha- maybe more so, that's maybe what's more important, have a, a good uh, performance based on certainty of knowing that um, his output, his... his um, his work ethic will be acknowledged and that he doesn't have to worry about the manager not liking him or, or, or these things that we think are petty, but are very, very much a part of the ecosystem of, of talent. Um, so uh, if going back to that, going back to your Mo Salah example, um, you know, you know, we, we can sit here and, and you know, take the task, whether it's uh, Jose Mourinho or anybody for passing up on, on Mo Salah. Um, if you want to use that uh, phraseology. But the thing about it is when you look at a player, especially attacking players, um, wingers are a little bit trickier. But when you look at forwards, um, the ability to play, to, to be um, productive, is really seen on – if they've transferred a lot, one of the players that just blew my mind, uh, to go on somewhat of a little different uh, take on it, just to give you – illustrate how my mind thinks – one of the players that completely blew my mind the last two seasons is uh, Georgios Giacomakis. Last season, he played at uh, VVV in um, uh, the Eredivisie in the Netherlands. That team got relegated, okay? I, I believe he scored 26 goals. Uh, 26 goals for a league that has plenty of goal scorers. Um, he did his best to keep them up, but obviously – he didn't do enough. Uh, he, they needed 10 more players to, to produce on his level. And it kept, I mean, I would watch the games week in and week out. And I'm like, there's nothing special about this guy. You know, he's not stronger than everybody. He's not like, uh, what was it, Adam Carroll, who's like 6'6". You know, he, he's not this oak tree in the box. How is he scoring? I mean, let's just go ahead and knock off nine penalty goals, right? So that he scored. How did he score almost 20 goals in the, you know, in the run of play? And what it comes down to, if you look at his play, like where he's played, he's traveled. There's a there's a durability in his uh, production to where he didn't he never had stellar numbers. But when he was in Greece, he scored goals when he had the opportunity to play. I believe he played in Poland for a season and he played. And then when, you know, he he played, I'm sorry, he scored goals in his limited uh, amount of, of playing time. And I forget the name of the sporting director at uh, VVV, but, um, and this is the, the intangible part that data won't tell you. Um, uh, he said that uh, he went to go scout him, I believe in Poland, and he had this uh, terrible aerial duel in the clash. Okay. So he, had, I mean, he had stitches and he goes to meet him and his agent in the uh, hotel uh, after the game. And I might be, um, butchering the story but essentially he still had the bandage on i don't know if he'd even showered yet and he said he just wanted to thank him for coming out to see him you know to see him play because he knows that um he hasn't had as many opportunities in his career i mean he was 24 25 at the time so to answer your question what i've found is that yeah that still is a a slippery slope but what you what you'll see usually the players that are um rugged the players that want to perform at a higher level um and the ones that keep their their bodies and their minds in good shape they tend to produce when they're on the field 
It's not when I say produce, I don't mean, you know, a goal every 90 minutes. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying more so is that you look at a whole cross section of of inputs, whether it's uh, minutes, shots, uh, duels, uh, interceptions. They are they're not you're not looking for them. You know, where's you know, where's Georgia? Where's he's I mean, you played 90 minutes, you know, you don't you didn't have a shot on goal. You didn't have, you know, one uh, one take on. No, those guys, they always show up. So more of a long-winded answer, which I'm, I'm kind of known for. <laughs> but but the, the data usually shows that when they play, they I hate saying this because it's cliche. When they play, they play. Um, even if it's scattered across different clubs over different seasons. Uh, it shows that they make a difference. I guess that's the one the reason why they do make those moves. The better players, they do make a difference. One thing you mentioned there, which is quite interesting, is about the effect that like a manager can have. Um, mm-hmm. and I think you, you see that at the top level. Um, as you see it all, all over level. If you have a good manager that relates to his players or has an identity of what he wants the players to do, they send, tend to really kick on in, in that vision. Um, is that something you see across the board? So do you see that in terms of if if a player goes into something that's the right alignment, right fit, I guess, culturally and environmentally, and they're doing a task which fits their characteristics, that's why you maybe see progression compared to other individuals who um, are being asked to fulfil roles that maybe don't necessarily fulfil their characteristics and putting a square peg in a round hole? Yes, yes. And it's something that I understand isn't as popular as... Um, you know, sharing replacements, you know, if I, if I share, if I have a Twitter thread on replacing, um, uh, not, well, not replacing, but players similar to Brian Brabby at Ajax, I mean, it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed that that's going to be shared and, and, you know, everybody, I'm, I'm going to get the uh, supporters, uh, pissed off at me, which is, uh, I find pleasure in that, ironically. I'll never forget a side note. So I, I did one of my threads on Ross Wilson and Scottish people are very, very strong in their opinions of football. I, I've learned that. So um, it, it was, <laughs> was eye opening uh, to me. But, uh, you know, uh, everybody wants to talk about players and data and, you know, um, XG or XT or XA. And yes, it has its place. At the end of the day, though, uh, we're talking about humans. And as somebody who's been a professional athlete, I can count. I can count on one hand, one hand, how many coaches that I would run through a wall for. Let me rephrase it. I, I can count on two fingers how many coaches that I would run run through a wall for. Two. And I've, I, I mean, I have, I, American football is vastly different just as far as coaching staffs. I mean, I've probably had 50 or 60 different coaches, right? Or managers, as you guys would say. So. Um, I, I guess a way of illustrating my answer um, is uh, in a Danish Danish uh, football, there's a coach. He's coaching FC Minchula now. His name is Bo Henriksen. So before, before the shutdown, before uh, COVID, he was at a smaller club in Denmark called AC Horsens. AC Horsens is a club that has, uh, let's just say they're very austere. They don't spend money. They don't have great players. Yet he kept that team up in the top league for three or four seasons. Now, going after the, the, the they shut down the season uh, for COVID and then they were going back and forth on coming back um, as, as a league, he decided after, um, I believe, uh, right after the season, right the first or second, or sorry, the second to last game of the season, that he wasn't going to return. Um, he was just going to take a break. I, again, I don't know the details, but AC Horsens basically said, Okay, well, you don't need to co- you don't even manage our team anymore. So they fired him. However, they want to word it. That's how that's how I took it. Is they fired him. That team got re- that club got relegated, and it they they were in, they were pretty much an abomination to watch the rest of the season. Um, and what I took from that was that okay, because uh, that AC Horsens team had two or three players that were very they could play in any team in the league, and one in particular who plays for uh, Alborg now, Luca Pripp. I mean, that guy's data for the past three or four seasons, I don't know why the bigger, well, I know why, but uh, he, he's he's more than competent. He's a, to me, he's a top performer in the league. So what that told me 
as somebody who was trying, because you know, you're always trying to weigh data versus video. Okay, can it, if I airdrop, so a perfect example, um, and I say this with, with hope, we, you know, I hope it works out for him and the club. You know, Jack Wilshire coming to Denmark, wow, good luck. Uh, and I say that not more so to him or his talent level, but more so that the, the, Danish, the Danish Super League is subtly very, very tricky. <laughs> very tricky. Um, and for a player of his caliber, um, I don't know what it's going to look like. However, who's his manager? And he has one of the best, to me, he has one of the best managers in Denmark, in David Nielsen. And what I've seen time and time again is you can have a talent, you can have the data, say X, Y, Z, you can have that. But if you don't have a manager who um, can amplify talent and can honestly amplify effort across the whole club, it, it's kind of a dead end. You know, I look at FC Copenhagen, um, just stay in Denmark for now. I see, I look at FC Copenhagen. Uh, I mean, they have the best roster. They've spent the most. So they'll probably, you know, either win or be second. But I already see blood um, as far as jobs because they should be blowing everybody out of the water. That same Bo Henriksen is now FC Midtown. And they have comparative talent, but they don't have as much money as FC Copenhagen. But, you know, what is what is going to be the, the final determining factor in uh, performance? I think it's going to, I, I always lean to, okay, like who are, who are you playing for? You know, who, who, who can take your emotion and your, um, your drive and obviously your, your statistical ability and put it in the best place to be leveraged forward. And that's always going to be the manager. Always, uh, you know, if you go, if you get on a plane, you drive over, drive, you fly over to Austria, look at what Red Bull Salzburg has done. When is the last time they had a manager that didn't go up a league after they left that, that um, Red Bull Salzburg setup? I mean, I forget his name as a Spanish coach, but it's like six or seven years ago. Like they, it's, it's about, yes, the system, system matters, but you have to have managers who inspire men. And that's that's something that um, I'm sure there's data points to, to a degree, um, you know, like, you know, goal difference and all these other things. But that's more of a um, to me, that's the most important hire for any club. Yeah. Like I said, we can talk about prospects all day long, but who are you going to send that prospect that you just drop however many euros to? If you're if you're taking them to a, a passenger manager who has his set ways. I mean, I hope it works out, but you need you need a leader of men in that position. And do you think that's why we're seeing and probably will continue to see maybe more what you consider left field appointments kind of in, in main Europe? I look at like Danny Ainge, for example, at Celtic. There was a lot of uproar, like, who is this guy? Not a lot of people were fully aware of him, but he's come in and done a really good job. And that's probably because the club had done their research in terms of, the style of football he played, the type of um, care he gives to players, etc. Do you see that being more of a thing with managers now where maybe the cycle that we were on, which is once you got into that manager cycle, you'll get another job and another job and another job regardless of results. We're actually moving to the stage where clubs will earmark or here are our managerial targets because they play the style that we want and they'll get the most out of these individuals that are on our target list, et cetera. I do. I agree. I, I think that's that if you look, uh, if you look four to five seasons or years out, you know, um, I shared it in the new, my weekly newsletter, transfer fees and buyout clauses and, and uh, contract expirations are going to become uh, more of a, more of a facet of, manager recruitment more so than what we see today yeah we see it with players especially at the higher level with uh whether it's mbappe or whoever yeah i, I mean it makes sense I mean, their inter intermediaries and agents um obviously get their cut which is always uh fodder for um everybody to talk about uh which i, I don't care about i mean that's it's part of the game so uh, you take that element out of the game and, and other things have to compensate for it However, the 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 uh, clubs that are thinking far ahead, going back to that Red Bull example, you know, um, 
not to be uh, <laughs> not to be crazy, but can Steve Bruce or Steve Bruce wouldn't fit in the Red Bull model, right? You know, like uh, and that's no knock against him. You know, he there's no knock against him. It's just more so clubs have to do a better job of finding finding uh, managers that are uh, there's a, here goes that word again competent to a playing style. Um, if you look if you look up at at the let's call it the executive tree in clubs. Uh, one of the things that I'll be sharing over the next coming week or so, one of the things that you see time and time again, who gets appointed, and especially in smaller clubs, smaller leagues, who gets appointed to the sporting director role? Usually an academy manager, you know, usually because they're, they're, they're used to being able to see the academy, the youth set up, but then also say, okay, we don't want to block pathways for, um, you know, just make up a, a player, Jaden Sancho. We don't want to block his pathway, but we also know that we we need a player who's between 25 and 30 years old, who is affordable, who can do a job. We don't need him to be Danny Alves at right back. We just we just need him to be able to do a job for a couple of seasons. That academy manager usually has the I call it the downward vision of the uh, the youth setup, but then also the upward vision of results because you you can't just have a great team on paper or a great plan. You know, one of my favorite lines from uh, Monchi at Sevilla is that, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't unfurl a banner for greatest economic results and have the fan, you, you know, you're not going to have a parade about that. You have to win, you know, it, you have to win. So to me, the clubs that are, the clubs that are thinking ahead of, as far as who is a viable, viable manager for our setup are the ones who are doing their due diligence. Uh, Angie Postoglu at, uh, Celtic, I didn't see that one coming. I mean, I'm not, I'm not some, I, I'm improving my ability to find managers. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, you, you have to have for the most fraught and unstable position, I think in sports, um, I mean, a good manager doesn't last more than two, two years. I, mean, I think it's even 18 months in his position. You have to have a rolling list of viable candidates and those viable candidates have to be they can be a lot of different things. They could be uh, assistant coaches, system managers. They could be the youth coaches. They be, could be coaches and other le- uh, managers in other leagues across the world. So that's to me, that's the next frontier um, because the the disparity in a good manager compared to an average manager can cost your team, depending on, um, uh, let's call it uh, Europe, depending on Europe and then broadcasting, you know, um, rights and all these things can cost you millions upon millions upon millions of, of euro in revenue you that's one that you have to get right yeah i think that's really interesting you mentioned disparity which is, is kind of one of the last questions i ask you obviously it's nfl free agency at the moment which i think the nfl that they do a quite thorough job of looking at people that might fit um that he obviously with the draft system have to go through lots of players from your guaranteed first rounders, your Peyton Manning's, Andrew Lux to your Tom Brady's in the sixth round um, that, that people might have missed. But from your perspective, do you see much disparity between what goes off in maybe a um, American football NFL capacity to what happens in mainstream soccer capacity? Wow, that is a great question. Uh, let me try to repeat it to make sure I, I, I'm i under. So you're saying, do you see, do I see um, the same disparity or same, like the same disparity from the NFL as far as, let's call it due diligence compared to European soccer due diligence? Yeah. Wow. You should ask that question first. That's a hard one. <laughs> Um, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll joking aside. Uh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think my answer is, is, is not a cop out, but I, I think that what you see time and time again is that the, the, the clubs that know what works for them, it's funny how things always work out for them. It's annoying. It's very frustrating. You know, I mean, people always ask me, what club do you support? And what I say is I don't really support clubs anymore. I mean, I, I played at, at um, professionally, and when you're on when you're on the other side, and the team that you're you know playing for cuts you, or they release you, or they get somebody else to replace you, 
it changes your your love for that, <laughs> for that team for that club at least it did for me so um what i would say as far as disparity i'll, I'll use i'll try to use two examples here um new england patriots uh, my favorite player, just because he is an icon to me as far as what, where you can go as a player if you, I mean, you need to get lucky. You also need to find a manager or a system that protects you. Uh, you know, we don't talk about, I, at least I don't see articles enough, enough about this. When you're 21, 22 years old and you're now getting paid to play a sport, you, you are emotionally a target, everything like people's like wanting to please people is something that um, if you don't have a framework, a team around you to protect you from yourself, it's really, really easy to fail, um, really easy to fail. So I think about Tom Brady, how, yes, they found him in the sixth round, but after watching him for, uh, he's a couple of years older than me, uh, watching him for 25 years, you know, he, he's always been a competitor but he was fortunate enough for the New England Patriots to draft him and to have him in their system because the New England Patriots are about their ethos is do your job, do your job, do your job, do your job. Uh, you do your job and you know, you do it well enough. We won't be able to pay you as much as you're worth and you're more than welcome to go and even come back if you want, but like, you know, do your job and everybody will get to where they want to get to and, and the team will win. I'm trying to think of a club that is similar to that. Um, well, shoot. I mean, it's, it's, it would be in, in the UK for right now, for what I can think of, it'd probably be Southampton to a degree. Um, a couple of seasons ago, or, or at least their ethos, maybe even, uh, Wolverhampton somewhat more recently. You, you come in, we, this is how we play, uh, Red Bull to Red Bull Salzburg. You come in, this is how we play. Yes. Yes. You're, you're going to have, I look at Erling Holland. Um, you know, one of the things, and I'm, I'm more of a product of it as well. People, everybody wants to find the next Erling Holland in Scandinavia, in Norway, in Sweden, in, in Denmark. And I, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. What I'm saying more so is that you can't, I, I mean, you can't just look at data of the top leagues. You, <laughs> you need to be, you need to have your due diligence on the under 16, the youth tournaments. And that's what Red Bull Salzburg did. They found, they saw they were able to project talent in him when he was 16. Um, I will never forget one of the when I first um, when I first started uh, posting more regularly on Twitter. Uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a scout on there, Xander Xander Wilkinson. He's uh, Heron Vane's um, uh, UK scout for their under 23s. And I just in passing, I mean in passing, I didn't didn't really know what I was even asking him. I was like, hey. Uh, the under 17 euro, whatever it was, uh, is going on. Who are some players I should look at? And he was like, there's this Erling Holland kid that is going to be, he's going to be pretty good. He goes, I'm not saying anything that's groundbreaking because it's obvious he's going to be good, but you should just watch him play. Again, I said it in passing. I didn't even really think about it. Didn't even think about it. The next game he played, he scored six goals, six goals against, I forget who it was. And it was, I mean, hates uh, hopefully your listeners won't take exception. It was murder. He he was destroying these other um, uh, profiles. Uh, I don't know what what uh, country they were um, representing. And I just remember saying to myself, "Wow!" And Red Bull already had him. Red Bull already had him. You know, on their books. So uh, to to hopefully answer your question, I think the due diligence is there. But what doesn't um, make headlines, what doesn't appease fans is that uh, the NFL, you're very much dealing with a um, more of a finished product of an athlete. You know, uh, you're, you're going to be, uh, to use American metrics, you're, if you're going to be a good quarterback, you're going to be 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and you're going to have a rocket arm. That's not something that's going to develop by age 30, right? You either, <laughs> you either have it at age 21 or you do not right and in football it's a little bit more nuanced than that um yes you, you need to have the athletic abilities but a good striker a good striker isn't always obvious at age 17 18 you know i think one of one of the things that i've found is that 
if you're a smaller club, I like to call them a small market club, you can find good strikers that are undervalued who are probably 23, 24, 25, 26, maybe even 27, simply because they're mature now. They've, they've traveled. They know how to play the game better. You don't always have that ability or that tactical nous at age 19. So the due diligence, the Red Bull Salzburgs, they, they do that. Um, the, I mean, there's probably seven teams in the second division in France who do it well. Uh, young boys in Switzerland, they do it well. Basel used to be very good at it, but they've had some ownership issues over the past four or five years that have made it to where they're refocusing on that. Danish clubs, they do it, they do it well. They, they find a way to balance um, youth, but also find uh, players that are on the fringes in Europe um, that are capable. So I think that the NFL has a bigger spotlight and quite honestly, more discretionary income to be a whole lot more thorough. Uh, European clubs don't have that uh, infrastructure, if you will, um, for them to in, put in a lot of money on the research and development side of profile, usually speaking, usually. Perfect. That's a really good conversation. I'm going to ask you one last question, which is one to watch. From all your research, younger player at the moment, who's your, who's your one to watch? Uh, give, me, give me a lead because there's... Well, we'll go Danish. We'll go Danish. Out there, a little bit different. Danish league, one to watch that you think might be able to make that jump. Ooh. Uh, well, um, there's really only one answer for me. So I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you two. Um, to me, the player in the Danish league, who's the one to watch, uh, FC Norseland has a, has an attacker. His name is Simon Adingra. Um, I believe he's from Ghana, uh, right to dream. This kid, every single time, every single game he plays, and, and mind you, this is going on a season and a half now, every single game he plays, he affects the game. Um, I don't know how other clubs or other people aren't talking more about him. I think it's just more so a, he hasn't he hasn't had that moment yet or that goal that becomes more viral. Uh, but that guy, uh, it, I if I was a team, um, if I was a team, if I was a top five league, if I, especially in France, it, that I would that that's the guy that you sign now. Like you find a way to meet whatever number is keeps FC Norshall unhappy. Um, and you, <laughs> you wine and dine his agents because that guy is, is elect, like the only word I can think of is electric, just take ons, uh, passes, crosses, um, shots from outside the box. Um, he doesn't look, he doesn't look like an, uh, like an Adonis. It doesn't look like Erling Holland where you're just, oh man, he's, he's just, he's a, 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 a mass of athleticism. No, he's wiry. He kind of looked, I don't want to say um, a certain player's name for, for people to uh, conflate uh, what I'm saying, but he, do, he looks very wiry, but he, I, I mean, there's nobody in the league that can do what he does, okay? Uh, so that's one. And he actually comes from a team that is not doing as well um, in the standings. And then number two uh, is uh, Rafael Onyadika. Uh, Nigerian plays for FC Michelin. Um, I think when, if you start doing this long enough, you start to catalog moments or plays or actions from a player where you're just like, and it could be good or bad. You know, one of the things that I shared is, um, a little ebook I made 50 recruitment biases, um, that cloud our thinking, but, uh, Rafael Onyadika, he had this, play, I mean, it, it, to me, it was crazy because he's not a forward, but he was right outside the box. He did this spin move and fired this shot and somehow hit the post. And I remember just sitting there saying to myself, you're 19. You know, you're 19. You're playing it. Like the, the two guys that he um, created space around were, uh, let's just say, they to, to protect the guilty. Um, those were all league, com you know, competitors. And he shredded them. Uh, so those two players, um, I could see on your – I mean, there's a sister club element there, but I could see Onyedike at Brent, Brentford in in July. I, I mean, he's he's good enough, in my opinion, to play in 
uh, mid table uh, Premier League next season or play in Bundesliga. He could play, be playing for Dortmund right now. Um, that's that's how I see his his talent level. And he, both of those players, I believe, are either nineteen and nineteen or nineteen and twenty. So those are my two players as ones to watch. And I don't think they're getting enough or any acclaim. Um, you know, nationally, like when uh, the Guardian comes out with their sixty, I forget what they call it, um, their next generation. I don't, I haven't seen either of them on there. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, uh, they make me right. Perfect. Listen, I, I'm conscious we're we're uh, past the time we allotted for this, but really appreciate your time. A great conversation. Hopefully, um, can can catch up with you again soon. And for people that forgot from the start of the call, what was your Twitter handle so they can follow them this work themselves? It's at undervalue. I do my best to uh, be objective, but to share just just what what is working for sporting directors and in re- recruitment. So it's at undervalue, and there's no there's no E at the end of value. So U-N-D-E-R-V-A-L-U. That's it. Appreciate your time. Catch up with you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.